This presentation is an expanded version of a free paper given at the Physiotherapy New Zealand Biennial Conference in Auckland, September 2016. The paper reports on the diagnostic accuracy of the clinical finding of directional preference in relation to the reference standard test of controlled provocation discography in patients presenting with persistent low back pain. Directional preference is a concept first described in general terms by Robin McKenzie in the 1970s and 1980s, but named as such by Ronald Donaldson and co-authors in a study that was published in Spine 1991. In that study, 145 patients from clinics in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom and the USA were subjected to the sagittal plane test movements described by McKenzie under strictly controlled conditions. Pain was mapped and intensity measured before and after single end range movements and sets of 10 movements up to a maximum of 40 movements. The order of test movements was randomized. These researchers found that 40% progressively worsened with repeated flexion and progressively improved with repeated extension. That is, they had a directional preference to extension. And in 7%, the opposite pattern was observed. Though lateral flexion and asymmetrical extension movements were also studied for their effects, these data have never been published and are now believed to be lost. It was McKenzie's hypothesis that this phenomenon is a direct reflection of what is called the dynamic disc model of biomechanics in the spine. In other words, the change in pain intensity and location is a direct reflection of increasing and decreasing displacement of the internal disc contents. The concept of directional preference is a broader concept than the related phenomenon of centralization. What I mean by this is that all cases of centralization also have a directional preference, but some cases of directional preference do not centralize. In the years 2001 to 2002, we put this theoretical model to the test. If directional preference was indeed a reflection of a mechanical disorder of the intervertebral disc, then hydraulic distension of the disc during provocation discography should reproduce the patient's typical pain if the patient reports a directional preference during McKenzie's repeated movement assessment. In a specialist spinal pain diagnostic clinic in New Orleans, 70 consecutive patients with persistent low back pain received controlled provocation discography and a complete McKenzie evaluation of the repeated test movements. The examiner, myself, was blinded to all previous investigations, including imaging, and the discographer, Dr. Charles April, was blinded to the results of my testing. Males and females were almost equally represented in the sample. Mean age was 43 years. Mean duration of symptoms was over three years. All patients completed a number of questionnaires, one of which was the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire that allows patients to be categorized into one of four disability groups. In this sample, 44% were severely disabled, and another instrument was used, which was the Distress Risk Assessment Method, or DRAM, and 38% of the sample were classified as distressed using that instrument. Each patient completed coloured pain drawings and scored pain intensity on visual analogue scales prior to and after every part of the assessment protocol. Pain intensity was measured after single test movements and after each set of 10. In most cases, the maximum number of movements carried out for each test movement was 20 repetitions. A positive test for directional preference was recorded when pain progressively worsened or became more and more peripheralized with movements in one direction and progressively reduced or centralized with the opposite movement. In this study it was not enough to observe improvement with one direction. The worsening and improving effects of opposite mechanical loading patterns had to coexist and very importantly, this had to be repeatable at least once. In other words, having observed a loading strategy that worsened pain 
coupled with the opposite loading pattern, improving pain, I repeated enough movements to confirm the fact that the improving and worsening directions were a stable and repeatable phenomenon. The reference standard for discogenic pain against which directional preference was contrasted was controlled provocation discography. In this test procedure, a spinal needle is guided into the center of the intervertebral disc and hydraulic distension produced by injecting contrast material. The pressure that is achieved within the disc was measured using a manometer. Throughout the procedure, the patient is sedated but awake and conscious. Normal discs can tolerate over 75 pounds per square inch without causing significant pain. That is over two times the pressure we put into our car tires. If provocation of the patient's typical pain occurs with less than 15 pounds per square inch, a concordant response is recorded. Confirmation of discogenic pain is only recorded when at least one adjacent disc can be pressurized to over 30 or 40 pounds per square inch without provoking the patient's typical pain. Immediately after the discography examination, the patient was taken into an adjacent room and a CT examination performed within 30 minutes. To confirm a disc as the source of pain, fissuring of the annulus must be demonstrated on the actual views in such a way that the outer one-third of the disc, that part which is known to be innervated, is reached by contrast. Now we have data from which we may make estimates of diagnostic accuracy. We have patients who either have or do not have a directional preference, and these patients either do or do not have painful discs according to the reference standard of controlled discography. Data are then entered into a 2x2 two two contingency table. This cell contains the number of patients in the sample who have both positive discography and directional preference. They are called the true positives. The cell contains the number of patients who have negative provocation discography and do not satisfy the criteria for directional preference. These are called the true negative cases. The cell contains the count of those cases who have a directional preference but do not have discogenic pain according to the reference standard of provo provocation discography. These are the false positives. And this cell contains the number of patients who have discogenic pain but do not have a directional preference. These are called the false negatives. If we take the data from the study of directional preference and insert the numbers into our 2x2 two two contingency table, you can see that these two cells contain the true positive and true negative cases. These cases are the instances where the index test, directional preference, matches the results of the reference standard, provocation discography. And these two cells contain the errors, the false positives and the false negatives. Overall diagnostic accuracy is a proportion of the correct diagnoses out of the whole sample. Diagnostic accuracy of directional preference is therefore calculated at 62% better than random chance, but by no means perfect. The error rate is also easily calculated when, and we achieve a figure of 38%. But now we must look a bit more closely. It must seem obvious to you that all but two of the errors are in the false negative cell. What does this mean? Well, the first thing you can say is that in this sample, 24 plus 24 cases, that is 48, or 71% of cases have discogenic pain according to the discography test, yet only half have a directional preference. The logical conclusion is that there are at least two different types of discogenic pain, those that have a, dire a directional preference and those that do not. Now we come to the diagnostic accuracy statistics that you are probably more familiar with. Looking at all the subjects in the sample, the sensitivity of directional preference to the reference standard of discography is 50%. This means that directional preference only identifies about half of the cases with discogenic pain. So it is not good as a screening test. However, the specificity is high at 
which means that when you use McKinsey's Repeated Movement Assessment Protocol and a directional preference is identified, you can be 90% certain that the intervertebral disc is the source of pain. The likelihood ratios are derived from sensitivity and specificity and give an overall picture of diagnostic accuracy. They are ratios, thus when you identify directional preference, a discogenic pain source is nearly five times more likely to be the source of pain than not. When directional preference is not present, the likelihood of the cause being discogenic is 50-50. Now we will look at a specific subset of the sample. There were 32 cases where the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire score indicated that the patient was severely disabled. For this group, the diagnostic accuracy of directional preference is somewhat different from what we found for the sample as a whole. Here you see the agreements between the directional preference findings and provocation discography. And here you see the disagreements. The key point here is that the two false positives in the whole sample were in this subgroup of severely disabled patients, and this has an effect on the specificity of directional preference. Sensitivity remains at a similar level of 55%, but the specificity of directional preference in the presence of severe disability is 80%, rather than 90% for the whole sample. The likelihood ratio of directional preference is still OK at 2.73, but significantly reduced. Negative likelihood ratio remains about the same. If we look now at the 36 patients who were not severely disabled according to the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire, the figures are obviously different. Here are the agreements between directional preference and provocation discography. And here are the disagreements. It is immediately obvious that since the two false positives in the whole group were both categorised as severely disabled, there were no false positives in the subgroup who were not severely disabled, and this has a dramatic effect on the specificity. Sensitivity remains about the same, but in this subgroup specificity was 100%. The likelihood ratio is actually immeasurable that is infinity. But the important point here is that the finding of directional preference in this subgroup appears to be as good as it gets. Now let's look at another way to subdivide the sample in possibly meaningful ways. Though disability and distress may be related, they reflect different domains of psychosocial factors that may influence diagnostic accuracy of clinical tests, such as directional preference. In this study, we use the Distress Risk Assessment Method, or DRAM, that is a tool to identify those patients whose symptoms of depression or somatization disorder are of sufficient degree that they may be classified as distress-depressed, distress-somatic, at-risk, or normal. In this analysis, we divide the sample into patients who are distressed according to the DRAM instrument or not. If you look at the 29 patients who are distressed, the figures are as follows. Here are the agreements between directional preference and provocation discography, and here are the disagreements. One of the false positives in the whole group was categorised as distressed, and directional preference recorded. Here you see the diagnostic accuracy results for directional preference in this subset of patients categorised as distressed by the DRAM instrument. The values are virtually the same as for the undifferentiated group. Sensitivity is just over 50% and specificity is high at 90%. And the likelihood ratio of a positive test, that is the directional preference, is over 5 if we look at the patients who are classified as not being distressed according to the DRAM instrument, a subgroup of 29 subjects, you can see the agreements between directional preference findings and controlled provocation discography, and here are the errors. As for the distressed cases, there was just one false positive. The diagnostic accuracy values for this non-distressed subgroup analysis are very similar to that achieved for the distressed subgroup, actually slightly worse, with sensitivity at 
and specificity remaining high at 90%. The likelihood ratio of a positive test is just under 5. So what does this mean in clinical practice? Well, the first thing that can be said is that when you don't have your patients complete a questionnaire on disability, but do find a clear directional preference using the McKinsey Repeated Movement Assessment, you can be about 80% or more confident that the source of pain is in the intervertebral disc. However, if you do have a measure of disability, and the patient can be categorised as less than severely disabled, you can on the basis of near perfect specificity, be almost certain that the pain arises from the substance of the intervertebral disc or the vertebral end plates. If the patient is severely disabled, then your confidence that the anatomical source of pain is the intervertebral disc suffers somewhat. Specificity is still high at 80%, but you are more likely to have errors in confirming the disc as the source of pain in the subgroup. Distress, as determined by the DRAM instrument, does not appear to allow the clinician to identify those cases where a finding of directional preference is compromised by the presence of psychosocial factors or other yellow flags that signal illness behaviours. Other instruments may be more effective, of course, and it is a reasonable subject for future research. It is known that the prevalence of directional preference as determined by the McKinsey Repeated Movement Assessment varies considerably depending on clinical environment and factors such as age and symptom acuity. However, perhaps 50% of all patients presenting with back pain do have directional preference if you actually look for it. If you do indeed identify a directional preference using the standard McKenzie assessment method, then the patient probably has a mechanical disc disturbance. And if the patient is not severely disabled or distressed, then the certainty of this diagnostic conclusion approaches 100%.